Cold Comfort Farm by Stella Gibbons, Chapter 10. It was now the third week in March. A fecund dream stirred the yearlings. The souk bind was in bud. The swede harvest was over. The beet harvest not yet begun. This meant that Micah, Irk, Amos, Carraway, Harkaway, Mizpah, Luke, Mark, and the farmhands who were not related to the family had a good deal of time on their hands in one way and another. Seth, of course, was always busiest in the spring. Adam was employed about the, the Beestenhausen with the yearling lambs. Reuben was preparing the field for the harvest after next. He never rested, however slack the season of the year. By the other star, but the other stark adders were simply ripe for, row, for rows and mischief. As for Flora, she was quite enjoying herself. She was mixed up in a good many plots. Only a person with a candid mind who is usually bored by intrigues can appreciate the full fun of an intrigue when they begin to manage one for the first time. If there are several intrigues and there is a certain danger of their getting mixed up and spoiling each other, the enjoyment is even keener. Of course, some of the plots were going better than others. Her plot to make Adam use a little mop to clean the dishes with instead of, an, instead of a thorn twig had gone sour on her. One day, when Adam came into the kitchen just after breakfast, Flora said to him, Oh, Adam, here's your little mop. I got it in Howling this afternoon. Look, isn't it a nice one? Look, isn't it a nice little one? You try it and see. For a second, she had thought he would dash it from her hand, but gradually, as he, started at the little mop, as he stared at the little mop, his expression of fury changed to one more difficult to read. It was indeed rather a nice little mop. It had a plain handle of white wood, with a white waist right at the tip, so that it could be more comfortably held in the hand. Its head was of soft white threads, each fiber being distinct and comely instead of being matted together in an unsightly lump like the heads of most little mops. Most taking of all, it had a loop of fine red string with which to hang it up, knotted round its little waist. Adam cautiously put one finger, put out one finger and poked it. "'Tis mine." "'Aye, I mean, yes, it's yours. Your very own. Do take it. He took it between his finger and thumb and stood gazing at it. His eyes had filmed over like sightless Atlantic pools before the flurry of a storm breath, of the storm breath. His gnarled fingers folded round the handle. Aye, tis mine, he muttered. No house, no kind. And yet tis mine, my little mop. He undid the thorn twig, which fastened the bosom of his shirt and thrust the mop within. But then he withdrew it again and replaced the thorn. My little mop, he said, staring at it. He stood staring at it in a dream. Yes, it's to clatter the dishes with, said Flora firmly, suddenly foreseeing a new danger on the horizon. Nay, nay, protested Adam. Tis too pretty to clatter those great old dishes with. Ah, mun do that with, with the thorn twigs. They'll serve. It'll keep my little mop in the I'll keep my little mop in the shed along with our pointless and our feckless. They might eat it, suggested Flora. Aye, aye, so they might. Robert Post's child. Ah well, I mun hang it up by its little red string above the dishwashing bowl. Never put my little pretty in the girt old greasy washing up water. Aye, tis prettier nor apple booth nor apple booth my little mop. And shuffling across the kitchen, he hung it carefully on the wall above the sink and stood for some time admiring it. Flora was justifiably irritated and went crossly out for a walk. She was frequently cheered by letters from her friends in London. Mrs. Smiling was now in Egypt, but she wrote often. When abroad in hot climates, she wore a great many white dresses, said very little, and all the men in the hotel fell in love with her. Charles also wrote in reply to Flora's little notes, her short informative sentences on two sides of deep blue notepaper brought details in return for Charles's about the weather in Herefordshire and messages from his mother. What little else he wrote about, Flora seemed to find mightily satisfying. She looked forward to his letters. She also heard from Julia, who collected books about gangsters, from Claude Hart Harris, and from all her set in general. So, though excited, she was not lonely. Occasionally, while taking her daily walk on the downs, she saw Elfine, a light rangy shape, 
which had the plastic contents, which had the plastic contours of a choir boy etched by Botticelli, drawn against the thin, cold sky of spring. Elfine never came near her, and this annoyed Flora, for she wanted to get hold of Elfine and give her some tactful advice about Dick Hawk Moore, about Dick Hawk Monitor. Adam had confided to Flora his fears about Elfine. She did not think he had done it consciously. He was milking at the time, and she was watching him, and he was talking half to himself. She's aye a spearin' at the windows of Hot Culture Hall, he pronounced it. How chicker, in the usual manner. To get a sight of that young chuck stubbard Muzz Richard, he had said. Something earthy, something dark and rooty at the, as the barren that thrust its tenacious way through the yeasty soil had crept into the man into the old man's voice with the words he was moved old tides leapt at his lo old tides lapped his loins so th that is the young squire asked flora casually she wanted to get to the bottom of this business without seeming inquisitive i blastin for a capsy set up yearling as a womanizer the reply came clotted with rage but behind the rage were traces of some other and more obscure emotion, a bright-eyed grubbing in the lore of farmland, in the lore of farmyard and bin, a hint of the casual lusts of chicken house and duck pond, a racy, yeasty, posty-toasty interest in the sordid drama of a man's eternal blind attack and woman's inevitable yielding and loss. Flora had experienced some distaste, but her wish to tidy up cold comfort had compelled her to pursue, to pursue her inquiries. She asked when the young people were to be married, knowing full well what the answer, what the answer would be. Adam gave a loud and unaccustomed sound, which she ha had with some difficulty interpreted as a mirthless laugh. When apples grow on the souk bind, you may see lust by his in a wedding garment, he had replied meaningly. Flora nodded more gloomily than she felt. She thought that Adam took too black a view of the case. Probably Richard Hawk Monitor was only mildly attracted by Elfine, and the thought of behaving as Adam feared had never occurred to him. Even if it had, it would have been instantly dismissed. Flora knew her hunting gentry. gentry. They were what the Americans, bless them, called dumb. They hated fuss. Poetry, Flora was pretty sure Elfine wrote poetry, bored them. They preferred the society of persons who spoke only, who spoke once in 20 minutes. They liked dogs to be well-trained and girls to be well-turned out and frosts to be short of duration. It was most likely that Richard was planning a Lyceum betrayal of Elfine, but it was even less likely, or it was most unlikely that Richard was planning a Lyceum betrayal of Elfine, but it was even less likely that he wanted to marry her. The eccentricity of her dress, behavior, and hairdressing would put him off automatically, like most other ideas. The idea would simply not have entered his head. So unless I do something about it, thought Flora, she will simply be left on my hands, and heaven knows nobody will want to marry her while she looks like that and wears those frocks, unless, of course, I fix her up with Mr. Mybug. But Mr. Mybug was, temporarily at least, in love with Flora herself, so that was another obstacle. And was it quite fair to fling Elfine all unprepared to those Bloomsbury custom Charlotte Street lions? which exchanged their husbands and wives every other weekend in the most broad-minded fashion. They always made Flora think of the description of the wild boars painted on the vases in Dickens' story, each wild boar having a leg elevated in the air at a painful angle to show his perfect freedom and gaiety. And it must be so discouraging for them to find each new love exactly resembling the old one, just like just like trying balloon after balloon at a bad party and finding they all had holes in and would not be blown up properly. And would not blow up properly. No, Elfine must not be thrown out into Charlotte Street. She must be civilized, and then she must marry Richard. So Flora continued to look out for Elfine when she went out for walks on the downs. Aunt Ida Doom sat in her room upstairs, alone. There was something almost symbolic in her solitude. She wanted, or she was the core, the matrix, the focusing point of the house. And she was, like all cores, utterly alone, 
You never heard two cores. You never heard of two cores to a thing, did you? Well then, well then. Yet, all the wandering waves of desire, passion, jealousy, lust that throbbed through the house converged web-like upon her core solitude. She felt herself to be a core and utterly irrevocable. She felt herself to be a core and utterly irrevocably alone. The weakening winds of spring fawned against the old house. The old woman's thoughts cowered in the hot room where she sat in solitude. She would not see her niece, keep her away, make some excuse, shut her out. She had been here a month and you had not seen her. She thought it strange, did she? She dropped hints that she would like to see you. You did not want to see her. You felt, you felt some strange emotion at the thought of her. You would not see her. Your thoughts wound slowly around the room like beasts rubbing against the drowsy walls. And outside the walls, the winds rubbed like drowsy beasts. Halfway between the inside and the outside walls, winds and thoughts were both drowsy. How enervating it was, the warm wind of coming spring. And when you were very small, so small that the lightest puff of breeze blew your crinoline skirt over your head, you had seen something nasty in the woodshed. You'd never forget it. You'd sp never spoken of it to Mama. You could smell, even to this day, the fresh betel nut with which her shoes were always cleaned. But you'd remember it all your life. That was what had made you different. That, what you had seen in the tool shed, had made your marriage a prolonged nightmare to you. Somehow you had never bothered about it. Somehow you had never bothered about what it had been like for your husband. That was why you had brought your children into the world with loathing. Even now, when you were 79, you could never see a bicycle go past your bedroom window without a sick plunge at the apex of your stomach. In the bicycle shed, you'd seen it. Something nasty when you were very small. That was why you stayed here in this room. You had been here for 20 years, ever since Judith had married and her husband had come to live at the farm. You had run away from the huge, terrifying world outside these four walls, against which your thoughts rubbed themselves like drowsy yaks. Yes, that was what they were like, yaks, exactly like yaks. Outside in the world, there were potting sheds where nasty things could happen, but nothing could happen here. You saw to that. None of your grandchildren might leave the farm. Judith might not leave. Amos might not leave. Caraway might not leave. Irk might not leave. Seth might not leave. Micah might not leave. Ezra might not leave. Mark and Luke might not leave. Harkaway might leave sometimes because he paid the proceeds of the farm into the bank at Beershorn every Saturday morning. But none of the others might leave. None of them must go out into the great dirty world where there were cow sheds in which nasty things could happen and be seen by little girls. You had them all. You curved your old wrinkled hand into a brown shell and laughed to yourself. You held them like that in the hollow of your hand as the Lord held Israel. None of them had any money except what you gave them. You allowed Micah, Irk, Caraway, Mark, Luke, and Ezra ten pence a week, each in pocket money. Harkaway had a shilling to cover his fare by bus down into Beershorn and back. You had your heel on them all. They were your wash pot. And you had cast your shoe out over them. Even Seth, your darling, your last and loveliest grandchild, you held in the hollow of your old palm. He had one and sixpence a week pocket money. Amos had none. Judith had none. How like yaks were your drowsy thoughts, slowly winding round in your dim air, in your quiet room, the winter landscape breaking under spring's pressure, beat urgently against the panes. So you sat here, living from meal to meal, Monday pork, Tuesday beef, Wednesday toad in the hole, Thursday mutton, Friday veal, Saturday curry, Sunday cutlets. Sometimes you were so old, how could you know? You dropped soup on yourself. You whimpered. Once Judith brought up the kidneys for your breakfast, and they were too hot and burned your tongue. Day slipped into day, season into season, year into year, and you sat here, alone. You, cold comfort farm. 
Sometimes Irk came to see you, the second child of your sister's man by marriage, and told you the farm was rotting away. No matter. There have always been stark adders at cold comfort. Well, let it rot. You couldn't have a farm without shells, without sheds, cow, wood, tool, bicycle, and potting. And where there were sheds, things were bound to rot. Besides, so far as you could see from your bi-weekly inspection of the farm account books, things weren't doing too badly. Anyway, here you were, and here they all stayed with you. You told them. You were mad. You had been mad since you saw something nasty in the woodshed years and years and years ago. If any of them went away to any part of the country, you would go much madder. Any attempt by any of them to get away from the farm made one of your attacks of madness come on. It was unfortunate in some ways, but useful in others. The woodshed incident twisted something in your child brain 70 years ago, and seeing that it was because of that incident that you sat here, ruling the roost and having five meals a day, brought up to you as regularly as clockwork. It hadn't been such a bad break for you the day you saw something nasty in the woodshed. And that's the end of chapter 10.